All right, welcome back to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin. This is Lecture 8, XQuery 1.0 and DTD. <laughs> I almost forgot myself. So last week, speaking of forgetting things, what did we do last week? Without turning to the slide called last time. OK, good. Talk about HTTP, get, and post, and how that works. OK, we talked about Tomcat. Tomcat's an example of it's a servlet engine, servlet container, application server. You can slap a whole bunch of labels on this thing. Uh, servlets and JSPs were one of the big foci for last week. So what was the, uh, what did we, we only glimpsed them so far, and we'll use them more in project four. But JSPs, we sort of liken to what other perhaps familiar technologies. like PHP, ASP, a lot of these languages in which you tend to see HTML and some programmatic logic intertwine. Nice thing about JSPs and servlets is that the latter allows you to factor out a lot of the logic from, say, JSPs and put it into something that's more of a pure Java environment, namely servlets. Good, so we'll continue using this server-side environment for uh, both projects three and four, and typically a lot of students end up using uh, either or both of these technologies in their final projects. So a word on the pre-proposals that came in. Realize that the pre-proposals really was just your opportunity, not only just to get yourself thinking about what you want to do for your own project, but in asking you to give three sort of sub problems, uh, putting three problems on the table that other people might solve, it was really just meant to get the juices flowing and sort of provoke some thought, provoke perhaps some discussion among students. So really, so far as the feedback, uh, the pre-proposal goes, there won't be much of a feedback mechanism from me unless you have specific questions. And it's in the submission of your project proposals, which will be due in a couple of weeks' time, that I'll then uh, weigh in more vocally on what you might want to think about, what directions you might want to consider, what kind of questions you yourself might want to consider. So do bear that in mind. But it sounds like there's some interesting ideas already floating about. So we looked at an architecture like this last week, which is by no means uh, the only way to do things, but we just introduced it as sort of a representative way of piecing a lot of different components together. And we had these question marks throughout. Do you put XML here? Can you use XML here? Should you use XML here? And it's sort of in the remainder of the course, we'll, we'll sort of tease apart those question marks and see, and you can judge for yourself, exactly where it does make good sense or bad sense to deploy XML at these various points. And we introduced some jargon last week of uh, client tier, presentation tier, business logic tier, data tier, all of which you can slap different labels on. But really, the idea, the spirit of that whole architecture was to have different logical components or different conceptual components sort of operating somewhat independently, but somehow pieced together by means of APIs or some other forms of connectors. And it's in project three where you're introduced to this, the spirit of this framework. In project three, we try to present you with a backend tier, which is really little more than a database. And this picture actually makes it out to be sort of more than it is, because what is users, our user database in Wahoo? It's just an XML file, right? So to call that a database is perhaps itself a stretch, but certainly for small scale projects, certainly like our own project three is very reasonable to use XML itself as a sort of database mechanism, certainly when initially developing the project. We had this sort of middle tier that we dubbed it as, which contains all of the logic, all of the Java code that you'll be writing. And in this is perhaps your interface to moreover dot com itself and realize too that you might have as part of your personal touch for project three some other aspect of logic in there some other third party service some rss feed or so forth someone similar in spirit to moreover.com but we will defer to you on the specifics of that and then finally you have this client here which fortunately you don't really write much of anything you simply use your own browser your own console window to interact with this project so at this point i'm sure that uh, you've probably checked this off your to-do list, right? You have Jay Harvard's uh, favorite topics and articles streaming at him as soon as he logs in. Yeah, no, all right. Well, but eventually Jay Harvard should be able to see his news feeds and such. What we'll do, I think, at the conclusion of tonight's lecture is because we 
pretty much covered and did our thorough walkthrough of Project 3 last week. We'll use section tonight, if at all, pending interest, for really Q&A and to sort of fill in any blanks you might have mentally as to where you should go, where you can go. Tonight's material, though, will introduce DTD, as you probably realized from reading the spec, that it's, um, it's introduced, but it's not so integral to the project itself. It's offered as a framework, but not really a component that you yourself have to interface with. It's in Project 4 where you'll write your own DTDs. So tonight, it's about these two topics, xQuery and DTD. So xQuery, for the first time in the few years this course has been offered, we can finally say that it has reached recommendation status just a few days before this course this semester began. So what does that mean in real terms? Well, long story short, because we'll spend a bit more time on it tonight, xQuery, as the name sort of suggests, is a query language, similar in spirit but much more powerful in functionality than, say, XPath, which up until this point we've been using to sort of query data, but only by means of these fairly unidirectional location paths. You sort of dive in and grab exactly the data you want, but if you want to then manipulate that data, for the most part you've had to use XSLT. And even many of you have already sort of tripped over some of the shortcomings of XSLT 1.0 in that you've probably found it in projects 2 and or 3, sort of non-obvious or perhaps a little more difficult or at least more time consuming to just implement some fairly basic ideas. Case in point, on the listserv last night was asked the question about escaping a URL so that spaces, for instance, are converted to pluses and that other uh, pseudo dangerous characters are converted into their HTML equivalents or rather URL equivalents. Well, it's not trivial to do that in XSLT 1.0. It is in XSLT 2.0, per our conversation on the listserv, but it's things like that, where you might have begun to appreciate very that XSLT and XPath, while great for some problems, for other problems, simple problems, they don't necessarily fulfill the need. And so there's a huge class of problems that just aren't handled well by these existing languages, and xQuery was meant to sort of give an XML-oriented developer sort of more tools, more means of access at data, more means of manipulating data. And one analogy, which is you know, perhaps fair in spirit, though isn't perhaps perfect, is that xQuery is like a, it's like a SQL. It's a, what SQL is to a relational database as um, xQuery would be as to XML data. So that's the spirit. So if you can think about things you do with SQL queries, xQuery gives you more of that kind of functionality, but it's not certainly just a translation of one context to the other. DTDs, meanwhile, document type definitions, these are something we've alluded to since pretty much the first lecture, and it's DTDs that specify exactly what XML data must look like, and what we'll do tonight is take a look under the hood at exactly how you write these DTDs, because rather ironically, they're one of the few things in this XML world that themselves are not written in XML which actually is kind of a pain if you're sitting down to write an XML parser, because you can use your own parser to parse all things XML, except the thing that says what your XML needs to look like. So uh, XML schema, by contrast, we'll see in a couple of weeks' time, is itself written in XML. Fortunately, DTD is not so hard, even though the syntax is a little crazy looking. So it's a recommendation as of this past January. Um, XQuery is, and I excerpted from the recommendation just a sentence that it tries to capture some of the spirit of the language. XML is a versatile markup language capable of labeling the information content of diverse data structures, data sources, including structured and semi-structured documents, relational databases, and object repositories. So what the recommendation goes on to say is how XQuery sort of acknowledges that design of XML and begins to allow you to query it in ways that up until now have either not been possible or have been more convoluted in their solution. So inherently linked with xQuery 1 is XPath 2, since pretty much they share the same syntax and structure for their queries. So really XPath 2 is used in xQuery. And by way of examples tonight, we'll try to make more clear exactly what it means to use xQuery, what it means to write xQuery. What we probably won't do this semester just yet is integrate xQuery into the course's projects, if only because it's just finally been standardized as version 1.0 as of January. And what that means in real terms is that there do exist a number of implementations of xQuery, some of which have been brought fully up to date, a couple of which are consistent with the previous version, the candidate recommendation of xQuery. Um, you don't yet see xQuery support in, say, any of the Xerxes, Zalin, Apache projects. You do see it, though, for instance, in Stylus. 
and in XML Spy and Saxon as well, the parser and package written by Michael Kay. So while there exist implementations of it, it's not something that you can necessarily trust will be at your fingertips in, say, a typical J2EE environment or Java 5 environment in general. So take that with a grain of salt. So what we'll do tonight is introduce it largely by way of examples and by a way of features. And if this is something you'd like to dive in deeper to with your final project, by all means, that would be uh, an interesting opportunity and rather timely at that. So with that said, it turns out that much of what you're about to see is already familiar to you. So XPath2 and in turn XQuery sort of build on the same ideas and the same syntax that you've been using in XPath1 and XSLT. So these are very simple XQuery examples. And what I've tried to do at the bottom of all these slides, it might be hard to see it tonight, but on your printouts and the PDFs online, you can reference some of the sites from which some of these examples have come. A number of them come from the recommendation itself, so you can actually see it in the context of the W3Cs onwards. What I've also tried to do is leverage our much touted uh, tutorials website, W3Schools, which also has some nice hand-holding type examples as well, and a couple of other sites as well. So take a guess as to what the second example here returns to you. Yeah, all titles of books that are children of bib elements that are in the file called books.xml. Right? This is pretty much identical to what you may have used already in the world of XSLT if you, for instance, already in your projects wanted to incorporate not just data from the XML that you're applying the style sheet to, but if you wanted to incorporate it from a second one using the document function. You've seen this by using variables and such. And this one here, what's the only difference fundamentally between two and three? The total and tied in that Perfect. So the, the third line here just returns all title elements no matter where they are in the document. Uh, make an argument for or against either of these, if you would. Perfect. So if titles can only be found according to this location path in the document, well then why are you making the processor search all descendants and self for any title elements if you, the developer, already know where they are? So a more efficient query, certainly for large data sets, is likely to be this one here. And many of you saw in Project 2 or appreciated in Project 2 the implications of using something like XSL key so that you could sort of pre-prepare the processor to find data that you knew to be in a specific location. And that, too, is a way of enhancing performance. So one of the cool things, and really one of the fundamental things in XQuery, is the idea of what's called a, how would you pronounce this? Yeah, it kind of works kind of neat, right? It's a flower expression. So all this acronym stands for is a for, let, where, order expression. So this is sort of the basic structure and sort of grammar form that a flower expression can take. And it's easier, I think, to appreciate what the implications are by way of a couple of examples. So take a look at this. And again, perhaps just to reassure you that while more powerful, it is, dare say, as intuitive as a lot of the syntax we've seen. What do you think this four-line flower expression returns exactly? OK. Returns the title. Okay. Okay, good. So what this returns is a whole bunch of title elements provided that the price of the associated book is more than 50, presumably dollars or something, and it returns them in order of title alphabetically. So what this effectively does is it's iterating, obviously, over all of the book elements at that specific path in the document. It's doing a, sort of the equivalent of what we've been calling predicates in our location paths in XPath 1. It's imposing an order. And this is something that's more SQL-like than it is XPath 1-like. right? Because realize that this is an X query expression. Only with XSLT could you actually impose some kind of ordering on your node set in this way. right? So already we see sort of this union of features. And then finally, it's returning, all right, what's X? Well, X stands for a book, so it's returning the titles. But it's iterating over this. So what this is effectively returning is a collection of title elements, or like a node set of titles, subject to those constraints. 
is their way of iterating over multiple XML documents. Absolutely, so long as you had access to them, say on the local file system, by way of syntax like this, you could absolutely iterate over numbers of them. And this too is where it shares a spirit with SQL. So just as in SQL where you can join tables and sort of combine different data sets using keys typically, well so in XQuery are you allowed to sort of start pulling data, not just deep from one document, but from multiple sources perhaps. And that's a powerful thing too. Something you've perhaps been able to do, think of your own Xtube examples. Even though that was just one big file, a lot of you did have to do these sort of multiple, uh, these lookups in multiple parts of the document so that you could figure out not only the neighbors, but then the, the names of those neighbors and so forth. And with XQuery, can you do a lot more of that just within the query itself and not through some number of say, XSLT templates. So you also have, if well implemented in the server, interesting performance implications. So consider, oh, yeah, sure, by all means. Is X like a parameter that was set earlier, or is it just a, like, is it a path? Is X. Is X in this case is a variable that you're defining on the fly. So think of this as like Java 1.5's new for loop syntax, where you can sort of define the variable in the for statement itself. That's all it is. Oh, sure. Specifically, yes, on each iteration, this variable x is being updated to reference the current book element in question. Okay, so absorb this if you could mentally. Fortunately, you have a printout, so you can refer back to it. But this is a snippet of XML that's offered in the XQuery recommendation itself, which the W3C then uses for the sake of a number of discussions about features and syntax. So I present this so that it's right there at your fingertips too if you want to pull up the recommendation. And clearly this is some kind of you know, bibliography or book-like database. We've got a book here, book here, and a third book here. So do feel free to reference that as we dive into um, an example, a little more complicated, but certainly more powerful than some of the queries that we've seen, say, in XPath. So, Take a look at this. It, uh, what this does, ultimately, is it seems to output a raw auth list element, or tag, and then closes the tag down here. So what's inside of this element? Well, we seem to have a, another iteration, and notice that, that we've incorporated here, and this too comes from the recommendation itself. It's one of the illustrative examples they offer. Here we're invoking a function called distinct values, which, as the name suggests, is going to return to us only the unique author values that are in the book at any location. Assume incidentally that books has been initialized to point to the XML fragment you just saw. So we're going to order by A, which again refers to an author, so it's going to alphabetize by these author's names, and then it's going to return the following structure for each of these author elements. Well, what is that structure? It's going to return the author tag, nested inside of which is going to be the name tag. Inside of that is going to be the guy's name. So, and think about, sort of think ahead here. What are we doing? Well, as this tag sort of suggests, we're outputting an author list, but a, a list of unique authors. That's sort of the end game here. So we output the name, and now we want just a list of the guy's books. So books is the tag, then we can nest with the squiggly braces here, another loop. And what are we iterating over here? Well, now we're iterating over all of the books whose authors equal the current author, which is dollar sign $A, we're going to order by title, just so we can keep things nice and pretty and alphabetize not only by author, but by title. And then we're going to return title. Now what this implies is that what you're effectively going to get is open bracket, title, close bracket, the title of the book, open bracket, slash, title, close bracket. So you really get that sort of XML equivalent being outputted here, nested inside of books. And that's going to repeat for each of the books. Meanwhile, this outer loop is going to repeat for each of the authors. And what you get is an XML fragment that looks like this. So you have again an author list. How many authors were in that original fragment? Turns out there were four. There were three books, but one of the books was co-authored. So we have here an author who wrote just one title, data on the web. We have another author who similarly wrote just one title. We have another author, Stevens, who wrote both TCPIP Illustrator and Advanced Unix Programming. And then finally, a fourth author who also wrote Data on the Web. 
So to put this into context, what this means is that if you are using an X query processor, which in the future or now can take the form of some command line program, although Zale and Xerxes don't support this just yet, uh, if you were to run this through something like Stylus or XML Spy or the Saxon processor, literally so long as you configured in advance, you know, books to point to doc of books or bib.xml, think of this as sort of XSLT that would be processed by an XSLT processor and the output would be some resulting XML output. Well, instead, it's now XQuery. You'd be running it through an XQuery processor, but the output still would be XML, as on the subsequent slide. I'm sorry? Double slash is the same as it's always been, so descendant or self. So that means pretty much it's the, the lazy man's approach to coding. Go find author elements anywhere. This, what, right, this is taken out of context, but in the recommendation, this is initialized to doc of uh, bib.xml or books.xml, whatever the file is called. So you can view the path of the file right? Yes, absolutely. That's what the doc function does. Just like in XSLT, the document function does that. Yeah? How do you get the title tag? I'm not sure if you've got that function. Good question. So where does the title tag, the open tag and close tag, come from? It comes by way of this. Because we're literally returning dollar sign $b, which is a book element, slash title, we're returning a title element. Well, what's an element? It's something that, in aesthetic terms, has an open tag and closed tag. This is in contrast with something like this, where we're not returning an element, we're grabbing a text node, which is just going to have pure text. So erroneous would be if we also said slash text, open paren, close paren, because then we wouldn't have the title open and closed tags as well. Right, which maybe is what you want, but doesn't seem to be what the intention was here. Good questions. So they need to use the XQuery mm -hmm. uh, to uh, neighbors. So basically, we run the XQuery to generate this kind of XML document, then we did manipulate that? Or you can. So how do you incorporate this? So think of it this way, and this is why I tried to liken it to XSLT. Assuming the program you're running your input through supports XQuery, you can think of what we just wrote here on the board, or what's in the recommendation. Think of this as like XSLT. So you would run this through Zalin currently, or you would click the play button in Stylus, and this would get executed. Well, if you instead have a, not an XSLT processor, but an XQuery processor, same idea. Toss this in a text file. Name it .xq or .xquery or whatever the appropriate file extension is for your system. Hit play or the equivalent. This would be executed by that XQuery processor and the output presumably would come in a window that looks like this. So again, it will depend somewhat on the systems, right? Because Zalin operates at the command line much differently from, say, XML Spy does in your GUI, but the spirit is the same. So long as you have a processor, the output you'll get will be similar to this in either file form, console form, GUI form, whatever. And what you can do is on the course's website, actually, I believe under software, I'll double check this later, but if you go to the XQuery category and this, under the software page, I believe I put up one or two hyperlinks to implementations of XQuery because what you can certainly get from the recommendation itself is a list of all known implementations of XQuery to date. The, the most robust ones probably are the ones built into these packages like Stylus and XML Spy and Saxon, sort of the better known ones these days, but that's just conjecture on my part. Okay, so that was a flower expression. Well, let's take a look at one that might be called a sequence expression, a little different in that we incorporate a bit additional functionality here as well, but also sort of an example you can still infer the meaning from, even without comments. So let's take a look. So this too is excerpted from the XQuery recommendation if you'd like to see it in its greater context. But here again we have a loop so for D in doc, so this appears to be iterating all of the department numbers in some XML fragment. This next one is sort of letting us define a variable for this iteration. So let E currently equal whatever employee belongs to this department. So it looks like in E now is a node set of all employees in the current department. And again, you can sort of imagine already what this XML fragment might look like, but it's got a bunch of department numbers and obviously a bunch of employee elements as well. So where, though, the count of employees is greater than 10. So what we're really doing now is only iterating over those departments that are kind of big. That is only those departments that have at least 10 employees. 
it's sort of a filter we've imposed. We're going to order by, it's a little more complicated here, but still syntax is pretty readable, order by their average salary in descending order. So where is this going to get us? Well, what are we returning ultimately? Well, we're returning a big department tag, and close the big department tag. What's inside of this? Well, between the squigglies, we first are outputting D. What's D? The department number. So we're outputting that. And notice, we're not just outputting the department number, but it's the department number element, which means we'll get the open tag and the close tag. After that, we're returning what? OK, so we're returning a headcount element, which we just came up with, or they did. And inside of that, sort of in the attribute value template style, between squiggly braces, we're outputting count of E. So this is telling you how big the department is. We just said what its department number is. And here, we're outputting the average salary of all of the employees in the current department. So effectively, you get this element called big department for each of the big departments that tells you, one, its number, two, the number of people in it, which we know already is going to be 10 or more, and you get the average salary of those 10 or more employees. Yes, yes, so pass, yes. Right, remember in XML, in XML, divide is div usually, not slash. So good question. This is not division here. It's a step. Right, let's see if we took this. OK. So I, I refer, I just wave my hands at the details because it's more sort of interesting to at least reason through the logic. And hopefully it's sufficient to sort of imagine what the example is that this excerpt is referring to in the document. But again, in the recommendation. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of allowing you, I mean, we were able to do this with sort of, dare I say, convoluted XPath queries with, say, Project 2. But yeah, you have much more flexibility now in how you're drawing data, how you're relating data by way of, um, by way of these iterations, certainly, by the, way, by the fact that you can define these sort of variables on the fly and then refine the query you're still working in to, for instance, filter by that uh, accumulation of nodes or order by it as well. So yeah, and I don't want to say that this is SQL for XML because they do have fundamental differences, but it certainly feels more like it. Certainly more versatile than, say, this unidirectional XPath stuff was that we've seen thus far. Ah, it's a good question. So where's the focus for uh, the intended use for XQuery? Multiple XML documents and XML database? I would say it's both. So there have existed now for years XML databases. Some students even in this course have opted to use them in their final projects to varying degrees of success, not because of the students' own shortcomings, but because of where a lot of these implementations are at. Uh, Zindice, I think, is one of, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is one of the databases that has existed for a few years in various beta and production forms. Um, exist, the capital X is another one. There may be a couple of others now as well. Those are ones that students in the course have experimented with. And I definitely think there's value in this trend toward modeling data as XML, not necessarily in the literal string sense and just storing big text files in databases, but transitioning what used to be known just as an object-oriented database to something that's structured in a manner that's uh, consistent in spirit with XML, whereby you query data by way of location paths or the equivalent, just because I think that's a nice mental model to work with. However, in the reality, I think you see that XML databases are still very much in their nascent form. And so instead, what you see more often, I would say, is the use of languages like XSLT and XPath and now XQuery on actual flat file XML files that themselves might just be stored in a database as, say, blobs, which isn't necessarily the best approach, but it's perhaps not uncommon, um, or simply pulling them from a local file system. So I would say, in reality, you see a lot of manipulation of just raw XML files or blobs from actual databases, but I would not be surprised, and I actually think it would be a good thing to move more toward query languages like um, XQuery but even, dare say, transitioning the world more toward an object-oriented model of database only because I think it fits humans' mental models much more effectively than ridiculous numbers of joins on relational databases 
um, allow for. I mean, this is why you have views, for instance, on a lot of database systems, because it's a lot easier for a human to sort of come up with the view once, let the database figure out how to model that. When I think you start uh, organizing things more hierarchically, I think you allow the developer to start thinking in terms of the data as he put it in there, not just based on the way that a database performs better if you break things up into tables and, you know, 3, three and F. So anyhow, long answer to a good question. Good question. Um, the designs, I think, are still up for debate. But an XML database is, I think, in short, you could define as a database that exposes the data as XML or as a DOM. And so what this means is that you can perform XML-related queries on it, location paths, X query statements, and so forth. How it's implemented underneath the hood is sort of an implementation detail. But the XML databases, as I've seen them thus far, certainly are not as high performing as the most optimized of relational databases are to this day. So I think you're seeing slow adoption, but I think it's an interesting direction to go in. In theory, and I've never looked at the... So that's true. You're right. You're definitely seeing the storage of blobs, essentially, XML files in relational databases. But these other databases that I mentioned earlier, Zindice, again, if I'm pronouncing it right, and Exist, um, those are more, they're designed to be more XML databases proper, whereby they're optimized for XML queries, XPath and so forth, and they're not just, you know, MySQL with a wrapper on top of it. So... But again, that's why I suggest it as an interesting opportunity for a final project because they're still in this rather nascent form. Um, a conditional expression. So what else can you do with this stuff? Well, imagine now that you've got a file called library.xml, which has a whole bunch of holdings. Okay, these holdings, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to return the following. So we're going to return all right, the current holdings title, but then we're going to ask a question, essentially and impose a fork here, if the type of this holding is a journal, then output its editor, else output its author. So again, sort of a simple example, but illustrates the additional logic that you can impose within an X query. This you could do in something like XSLT, but not within the query language itself. So again, with X query, you get the ability sort of at query time to select only what data you actually care about, only what data you want to work with, whereas in XSLT, you could certainly implement the same, but it would then be pushed back, not to the query, but rather to your actual implementation of some number of, say, templates. So again, more power with just your query language alone. Absolutely. So this is, I believe, um, when, you've got the, when you've got queries sandwiched between, essentially, squiggly braces, what this is is a sort of demarcation between elements that you want to output. So whereas what's before this comma outputs a title element, what's after the comma is going to output some other elements, which in this case is going to be an editor or an author. And we saw this in a previous example whereby we had it for this. We had an element being outputted here, another element being outputted here, and another. And I believe the motivation is so that you can allow for and allow the X query parser to distinguish the logical components in your code so that this whole thing is sort of an entity unto itself. Correct. So Saxon, I believe, though, you could run, say, at a command line environment. But again, uh, XML Spy and both Stylus, I believe, have XQuery support. So what you can simply do, and I believe Stylus, is just go to the new menu, choose the new file or whatever, and choose an XQuery document. Okay. Paste this code in there, associate it with the XML fragment from, say, the W3C's recommendation, click play, and you'll see the output that I've pasted in. And XML Spy, I think, has similar buttons for the same. Realize, though, it, Stylus and XML Spy, think of them more as playgrounds for sort of developing the X queries. It's hard to imagine using XML Spy or Stylus as part of your own application, which is why you turn to something more like Saxon, which you could incorporate its jars into your own project. But again, Stylus and XML Spy are, even with some of their shortcomings, are wonderful development and certainly learning environments, I would say. All right, some additional syntax before we dive into DTD and examples thereof and some demos. So here, again, we're going to iterate over that bib files, bib.xml files book elements. 
And now we're going to have these quantified expressions where we're going to filter based on satisfaction of you know, most of our criteria. So, so for each book where there is some p in this, so what is this? So dollar sign p, so where there's some paragraph in that book that satisfies the following expressions. Either p contains the word sailing, or rather, p contains sailing and p contains windsurfing. So again, fairly readable syntax, but what this ultimately is doing is going to return all of the titles of books for which what is true? They eat, so long as each book, we're going to return the titles of all books that have at least one paragraph each that in that same paragraph mentions sailing and windsurfing. So in spirit, this is like, give me all the titles of books that are most likely about sailing and windsurfing because they happen to be mentioned in the same breath, essentially. And this one down here, well this time, for each B in book, so for each book, return the titles so long as every paragraph contains the word sailing. So what this effectively is saying is return to me a list of uh, all of the title elements of books that are really about sailing, effectively. So again, you have sort of a, the notion of some, and there exists all in the paragraphs there. Um, so finally, yes, pretty much finally, so data types in xQuery, it's a heck of a long list. Um, this is sort of a teaser, though, of what's to come in XML schema. So among the things that XML schema will introduce to us is this notion of data typing, which up until now has sort of been a bit loose, to say the least, where, yeah, there are numbers, there are strings, but it really gets this useful automatic conversion between the two. There's no uh, strong typing. If you get an XML document, you pretty much thus far have had to cross your fingers that the price is going to be number, number, dot, number, number. If it's anything else, your code might break. Consider, for instance, the B2B time. You were allowed to just assume that the input was going to be in a prescribed form, but you yourselves were not expected to do any kind of error checking. And if you had, it really would have been a pain to do in XSLT. And your 12-line you know, style sheets probably would have grown to be much larger to achieve a fairly simple bit of error checking. So we're going to see tonight with both DTD and soon schema even more so how you can sort of factor out that so-called validation to another environment, another language altogether, which is a powerful trick. These are all of the data types supported in xQuery, and this will make a bit more sense uh, when we put it into the context of XML schema. Long story short, with schema, for instance, in particular, will we be able to say, before your SACS events even get invoked, before your DOM calls get applied, before your XSLT templates get applied, you will be able to use XML schema and DTD to ensure that the data that actually reaches your application is quote unquote valid. And that means it is formatted in and structured in a way that you expect. And if it's not structured in that way, your application won't even receive the data. Instead, some error flag will go up and you'll be alerted that, no, you can't even parse this data because it's not in the prescribed format. And that's a useful thing because it lets you, the developer, trust that the data is going to be formatted as you expect. And that's certainly useful. So more on this with XML schema. Finally, just to give you a, a sense of some of the other features as well, um, you can also um, apply expressions to um, using XML schema. So for instance, you can actually ask questions of the form, is this element an integer? And you can do this by way of instance of. So you can do reflection of sorts using xQuery to check your data as you query it. Type switching, so just as many languages have the notion of a, a switching construct, so can you switch in this case on um, the type of element. So not just the value of the element, but the type of it. And this is sort of a neat trick, too. If you know, for instance, that your data, your data might contain addresses, billing addresses in this case, but they could vary in their fundamental structure. Sometimes the structure of that billing address is going to be for a US address, sometimes for a Japanese address, sometimes for a UK address, all of which are somewhat different in structure, right? We have zip codes, and other countries have um, you know, from um, Xtube, for instance, a bit more about the addressing scheme used elsewhere. So they're not certainly identical. But using type switch, you can check, well, is the current billing address a US address, a Canadian address, a Japanese address, or something else altogether? And that's perhaps a useful thing. You can cast 
um, data types as well. So just to give you a teaser here, so if x is castable as hat size, so what does that mean? Well, if there's some kind of hierarchical relationship whereby it's valid to say that x is of type hat size, well, then you can cast it as hat size. Again, taken out of context, perhaps a little tough to wrap your mind around, but just think of this as you know, offering what Java already does. If you have some kind of poly, uh, support for polymorphism and so forth, and for inheritance, well, you get that same feature with XQuery and really with XML schema. A powerful thing we'll see in schema is that not only can you use any number of those 40 some odd data types, you can also extend and restrict all of them and define your own data types, which is powerful as well, and you can have them inherit from one another. So does the use of cast and castable imply that you're using some kind of schema? Yes. So what XQuery 1.0 uses is XML schema as its data typing model. So um, yes, this does assume that there's some external source of knowledge telling you what the relationship is among these data types. Other questions? Yeah. In the area where we had contains, oh, in, um, for instance, these examples here. I believe so. I'd have to double check the spec, but I believe it doesn't necessarily have to be hard-coded constants like that. But let me double check. I'm assuming you're referring to something like regular expressions or yeah. the like. Yeah, let me just double check with the spec. Other questions? Okay, so the one non-XML language that you're going to get in this course. And ironically, this is in the recommendation for XML. So if you've never flipped through the recommendation for XML and you choose to do so, you will see DTD formally defined in there along with the grammar for XML itself. So we introduced this by way of project three. And last week, I encouraged you just to sort of turn a blind eye to some of these details if they seemed a bit distracting or overwhelming. Well, tonight, we'll just tease apart some of the details. In project three spec, and in the distribution code is the DTD for moreover.com's newsfeed. So this is an example of an article that's pulled from the moreover newsfeed, and this was taken from a week or so's time and cached in our biotech news.xml file. And the point we make in the spec is that you can trust that, well, so long as moreover sort of adheres to their own standard, you can trust that all of the data you're going to be getting via your Wahoo portal from moreover is going to be structured in a prescribed way. Specifically, we say in the spec that any of the, uh, any time you request the moreover news um, feed of information, you can trust that it's going to be structured in this way. So let's just tease apart visually or perhaps guess in advance what some of this is meaning. So we'll assume for now because we know it from the previous example in the spec, that the root element you get back when you request information from moreover by way of our news provider class is an XML fragment whose root element is called moreover news. Okay? And again, if, you're not, if you don't believe me, don't believe me. That's what you get. So what is inside of the moreover news element? Well, by example, it would seem that it contains zero or more articles. Right? We just saw an example of one article and if you've been playing around with Moreover's feeds, you've been getting zero or more articles from a particular news feed, biotech or some other category. So just to give you the teaser then, what this implies, because we have parentheses, parentheses, and then article star, all that means, as you might infer, is that a Moreover news element can have zero or more article elements as children. And that's it. Well, that begs the question, sort of recursively, well, what's an article? Well, an article is defined by its own element declaration. So an article element has as its children, as implied by the parentheses, each of the following children. A child called URL, one called headline text, source, media type, cluster, dot, 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 all the way to access status. In that order is the implication. So the fact that these things are separated by commas and listed in this order means that the first child of article is URL, the second child is headline text, and so forth. That is what imposes the so-called document order on the children of an article. Well, can an article have a, an attribute? Just to ask perhaps an obvious question. Yeah, it looks like it can have an ID. So this at list declaration 
means that the element called article can take an attribute called ID that's of type ID. We'll come back to this in a bit. And then it's implied. And we'll see what that means in a bit, sort of its default value or specification. Well, in turn, let's finish off the rest of the list. What's a URL element contain? Just piece, just text, right? Parsed character data, PC data. And everything else on the list is just PC data. So at this point, moreover, just says, eh, it's going to contain some stuff. Not other elements, but character data. And that's what we might expect. Zero or more characters, like the URL, like the name of the, the body of the headline, and so forth. So this is DTD. If the moreover newsfeed is said to have a DTD, that means that it has something like this associated with it. And we'll see there are different ways to associate a DTD with a document, one internal, one external. But we've also said, and we've long been writing, XHTML for, say, Projects 2 in particular. A lot of the output you generated was for XML, uh, XHTML 1.0 transitional. Well, what did that mean? Well, assuming you actually wrote XHTML 1.0 transitional, it meant that your code was consistent with the definition of XHTML 1.0 transitional. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means the W3C some years ago wrote a DTD that syntactically looks like this, but it doesn't define elements like moreover news and article. It defines elements like body and head and H1 and so forth, div, span. So if your document is said to be XHTML 1.0 valid or compliant, all that means is that your document is consistent with something that looks like this, but obviously relates not to Moreover's news, but to XHTML. HTML4 has the same sort of specification written in DTD form. It's SVG has the same kind of specification. So in short, XML, when it was invented in the form of the recommendation for 1.0, came with this notion of DTD. And this was the language with which XML uh, was, uh, the format and structure of XML documents was to be specified. XML schema, which we'll come to in two weeks' time, is sort of the next version of this idea by which you can define the validity of a document, the structure of a document, but in a much more expressive, dare say, verbose way. So let's take a look at this. This is an example of perhaps the simplest XHTML 1.0 document that you can write that it is valid. What does that mean? Well, that simply means that one, if in real terms you run this through the W3C's validator, it's going to come back and say, yes, valid. But what does that really mean? It just means that every element that needs to be in the document is there. In fact, if I just remove the title element, that would render the document invalid because the DCD for XHTML does say that you must have an HTML tag, you must have a head tag, you must have a title tag, even if it itself has no text children. You need to at least have the element present, and then you have to have a body element as well, even if it's got nothing in it. But so long as you have those basic building blocks, pretty much everything else is optional. Why don't you need an open tag for which? Uh, so we do have an open tag. We just simultaneously have a closed tag. So this is just what's known as an empty element. So they're both there. And it is XML compliant, which means that even though you know, most browsers wouldn't necessarily understand this, or at least odds are there are some browsers that don't understand this, it is consistent with the spec. So one that is consistent with the spec should understand this. Okay, so this is just perhaps a summary of some of the things that we've already said. Um, perhaps these last two bullet points are worth dwelling on for just a moment. Schema, you'll see, is much more powerful. It does a lot more stuff, does a lot more, offers a lot more features consistent with, say, data typing in a programming line, a traditional programming sense. DTD is almost a quick and dirty way of specifying a document structure, which is often sufficient, though, for most purposes. But we'll see some of the limitations of it tonight. Um, motivation. So again, a lot of this is background material, which I'll wave my hand at for um, during this voiceover. But the last bullet point is sort of worth considering. So when it comes to sort of XML is obviously becoming all the more popular, and everybody seems to at least like the idea of considering it as the format for their own data. So the nice thing about DTDs and their existence is that if you want to come up with, for instance, your own XML format for your own internal uses for documentation, well, why bother coming up with your own type if you can sort of pull one off the shelf, DocBook, for instance, and use, in turn, tools that already exist 
for documents in that particular format? Why come up with your own financial format for your own financial related data if there already exists something like OFX, which even if it's not precisely what you want, at least has support for it in other applications or tools that just know how to process it. So the fact that there just exists a language like DTD for standardizing the format of XML data sort of has these fringe benefits of allowing other people to sort of adopt the same standards because they have this common language that they can communicate with one another what their data needs to look like. Right? You could certainly, in English prose, say all of this. DTD is simply the technical language in which you specify everything precisely. Perfect. It's like the blueprint. It's the mold out of which XML documents are made, assuming they're valid with respect to a DTD. And that phrase I just uttered, too, is sort of the lingo you would use. An XML document is said to be valid with respect to a DTD, or it's invalid with respect to it. Uh, another, again, some background information. We'll get to the demos and fun stuff um, in just a moment. But certainly one of the motivations to have a DTD or not have a DTD depends on your application. Right? The fact that even though we present DTDs in Project 3, we don't really use them because it would almost be silly if you're pulling data from Moreover, but you're constantly checking, is the data I'm getting from Moreover consistent with its DTD? Right? It's almost better for performance reasons just to assume that the data source is going to provide you with the data in the manner it he or she prescribes. So even though there exists a DTD that you could constantly validate all of the news articles you're getting from the source against, it's almost just as useful for you, the programmer, to use a DTD, not so much for validation, but as the blueprint for the data you're going to be getting so that you can develop your application knowing that this is sort of the spec that the other guy is going to be adhering to. And for that, too, it has uh, utility. Okay. So it's standard to put a reference to a DTD in your document? Yes. Uh, is it standard to put reference to a DTD in your document? Yes and no. And we'll come back to when you can or should use this syntax. But this doc type element that thus far you've probably been just blindly copying or just using in our sample files essentially is the doc type that you need to include if you are writing a document that itself is to be XHTML. The W3C has standardized what it means to be XHTML 1.0 transitional. And so literally, if you pull up the recommendation for XHTML 1, you'll be explicitly told this needs to go at the top of your document, really as a clue to the processor, which in most cases is a browser, as to what language it is in your document. So think of this almost as similar in spirit to the namespace stuff we dwelled on in the past week or two where you have these hard-coded strings that you simply must adhere to if you are going to sit down and write what you would call an XHTML compliant browser. Fortunately, this is more cryptic than the doc type declarations that we'll be using and that real people use in their own applications. The complexity here is partly a function of this being a W3C recommendation. So it's actually simpler to associate doc types, with, uh, DTDs with XML data than this implies. Other questions? All right, why don't we go ahead and take a five-minute break, and we'll come back with demos. All right, we are back, and we get to the demos, finally. So the nice thing about DTD is that it has long been supported by a lot of the tools we've been using. And so what we'll do with some of these examples is actually use Xerxes as our XML parser to not only parse some of these relatively simple documents, but also to validate them. And simply by making some simple, stupid typos, can I show you exactly how these things will fail to prove valid. So here's an example of a Dave Matthews song. It's got a bunch of information associated with it. And what's kind of neat about this example is that it already hints at sort of a need, perhaps, or certainly an uh, application, potentially, of data types. Because even though something like the title of the album, Every Day, is just really a varchar, it's a string of some sort with no inherent format, certainly when you start talking about things like length or years, is there sort of a, certainly a, an inherent conceptual idea of a data type. And it might be nice for your code to be able to assume that the length of something is always going to be number colon something. 
something in that format, to be able to assume that you can just treat year as a number and you yourself don't have to try parsing it, catch an exception if it doesn't quite parse as a number but instead is something else. So those kinds of ideas even come out from simple uh, elements like this. So in our examples 8 directory, we have, for instance, song1.xml. And this file really gives us a teaser as to how one way that you can associate a DTD with an XML document. This is what's known, and we'll put it on a slide in a moment, known as using it as an internal subset. In other words, you just plop the DTD in the XML document itself, and if you use the right syntax, what this means to whatever parser parses it, that it better use this DTD to validate the document if so instructed. All right, just put them both there together. So let's see what this thing is. It's not all that complicated. It looks like at the top, if you're going to embed the DTD in the XML document itself, you specify literally a doc type declaration. And you've seen this, but in much more complicated form for XHTML and SVG and so forth. We specify, when using an internal subset, as it's called, the root element. So essentially, you specify doc type and then the name of the root element to which you want the following stuff to apply. So in this case, it's song. Well, in turn, we define what a song element is. The order of these definitions doesn't matter. Typically, with the examples, I've tried to go top bottom so that the first element you see in the actual instance, you actually see first and then the DTD. It's not a requirement, but logically, it kind of flows nicely. The order within parentheses, though, we'll see does matter. So at the top, I have an element called song. And a song has the following children in this order, a title, one or more composers, one or, uh, zero or more producers, zero or more publishers, a length or no length, a year or no year, and one or more artists. So this too is just sort of familiar regular expression syntax. Anywhere you see, and I wish I'm using my finger as an insufficient wooden pointer tonight, a plus means one or more, a star means zero or more, a question mark means zero or one. So it's either there or it's not. And so you see those used throughout this top line. What in turn is a title? Just PC data. What in fact is everything else? Just PC data. So there, even though we're imposing some structure on what a song is, we're kind of punting on the rest of them and just saying, eh, so long as they're there, that's all we care about. And each of them contain effectively zero or more characters. Yeah? What other kind of data typing can you do in that context? Can you do a numerical data typing for the length or year? An excellent question. I'm going to partly defer that, but the question is, what kind of data typing can you do? Short answer is terribly little. You're kind of seeing it. Um, slight white lie, but there is some notion of data types, but not terribly precise. So we'll come back to that if we could in just a bit. So does this adhere? So yes, this is consistent with this DTD. And that is simply to say that these, it, this instance of XML adheres to this document. It is valid with respect to this DTD. So let's try to tease some of this apart formally, and then we'll run this through a parser that either says yes or no, it is indeed valid. So this is that same file, the DTD for a song element. So just in general, just so that we can start writing these ourselves, so the element declaration, and this is why I sort of introduced these things by way of example, because they kind of explain themselves, but just to toss a tad bit of formality around it, if you want to define an element, you simply specify bang element, the element's name, and then the so-called content model. And remember the jargon from lecture two, when we talked about content models. You can have empty content, mixed content, and so forth. The same jargon's coming back here, because again, this was in the recommendation for XML itself. Well, what else can you have besides element declarations? Or rather, what else can you have within element declarations? So you can have PC data as the content model. And this was just parsed character data. Again, you can have empty, an empty content model. So for that, you just specify all caps empty. You can have element content, and we've seen that with the parentheses. You can have mixed content, which we'll see in a moment means parentheses with PC data mentioned as one of the children. And any, which is where you really just wave your hands and say, I don't care. It can have something, it can have nothing, it can have everything, I just don't care. But I do care that the element's there. And that's why you're defining it in the first place. So again, remember that we're, we're sort of nicely tying together all that stuff from long ago in lecture two back to the present with DTD. So element content, just to give you some examples thereof. Well, we saw this example already. What does this imply a spec has in English? The second bullet point. A spec has a 
Yeah, so it's got a front child, body child, and maybe a back child. That's pretty much all it says in English. And this last one, div one. So a div one, and notice now, you can have, you, there is regular expression syntax. It's not complete, as you might find in Perl or PHP and so forth, but it gets the job done, at least for a lot of purposes. A div one element can have the following children. A head element followed by zero or more P elements, list elements, or note elements. Zero or more, so that's sort of like a loop. Have any a number of those. And then finally, it's going to end with zero or more div2 elements. Kind of a contrived example, but just shows sort of the flexibility here and the use of the or operator and the nested parentheses and the commas and the stars and so forth. So yep. Oh. The yep, in any order. Yep, because you have these nested parentheses with the star on the outside, that effectively means you can go through that set of elements, P, list, and note, any number of times, and each time pull them out in any order. So it allows you to sort of jumble the order. But it does imply that heads got to come first, and if there are div twos, they've got to come last because of the commas. So the commas are what sort of impose the ordering. So just the building blocks to review. Most of this is familiar to you already, and since I also recapped it verbally, uh, is there anything new here? No, this pretty much just formalizes the examples we've already seen. So consider that a brief reference. Mixed content. So only one gotcha here, really. So mixed content, terribly common, certainly in the world of like XHTML, which you've been writing, and SVG, where you intermingle both prose and element content, or tags. So here's an example where we have mixed content, because we've got elements as children or descendants, and we've got text in there as well. Well, how do you do this? Well, this here specifies that a P element can have zero or more instances of PC data, A, U, B, I, or EMs. So a simple version of HTML, if you will. But what's key to remember is that if you can have mixed content, the only gotcha is that PC data must be declared as the first child. Must be listed first. Can't just put it anywhere. And typically, if you have mixed content anyway, you probably have the plus or the star operator anyway if you're sort of intermingling things as it is. So what this means is that if you do want to allow character data within your children, you have to mention it first. And that does mean there are certain things you can't quite express, but such is the way it's defined. And that's what you'll see. And perhaps there will arise questions where you wonder, how do I do this? A lot of the times, the answer, frankly, will be you can't. And thus was motivated XML schema's development. How about this one? A PO, purchase order, similarly can contain mixed content here. And this is sort of, a, sort of an interesting example that sort of borrows the spirit of the paragraph element, but for more XML data proper. But you can certainly think of other ways to do this that avoids the need for uh, mixed content anyway. And that's a throwback if you remember the infomercials from yesteryear for the Flowbee. I think I provided a URL. Yeah, you can look it up online if you've never seen. It's like a vacuum that cut your hair, essentially. So atlas, just to formalize this. So an atlas, we saw already when we said the element earlier can have an ID. So what does this mean to define an atlas? Well, there's the syntax. You specify atlas and then the element's name. White space is sort of irrelevant. A nice convention to use is to sort of list each attribute on one line on its own, just because it's easier to read. So if you want to have two or more attributes, you would simply list, uh, list them like this, with the attribute's name, followed by its type, of which there will be terribly few, we'll see. And then its default declaration, which sort of specifies if it's optional, what its default value is. But we'll see an example of that in just a moment. So the at list for term def. So again, think of this as an attribute list for an element called term def, term definition. So what attributes can or must the term def element have? Looks like three. One called ID, one called type, and one called name. Okay, the value of the ID must be of type ID, capital ID. So this is one of the data types that does exist within DTD. All this means is that if the attribute is of type ID, it, is, it must be unique. It must be unique. So think of my blockbuster. We didn't use a DTD for that thing, but it probably would have been appropriate had we written a DTD, knowing this now, to declare that actors' IDs, actors' references that we then refer to them as, must be unique. 
What this allows you to do then as the developer, if you're reading a DTD and writing code to be consistent with that DTD, the input incoming data, you can sort of trust that the IDs are going to be unique and that's useful if you're going to store the data, for instance, as keys in a database. There are some restrictions as to what format the IDs can come in, um, whether or not they can be numeric, alphanumeric, and so forth. So I'll defer that detail for now. But suffice it to say for now, it's terribly limited, unfortunately. Um, C data, character data. Just, it can be pretty much anything, zero or more characters. And the default declarations allow us, and you have to use this syntax, they allow you to specify if the attribute is required or if it's optional. And uh, for whatever reason, implied, means it's optional. So if you specify sharp implied, that just means it can be there or can't be there. It doesn't matter. If you specify required, it's got to be there. So what does that mean? If it's not there and Xerxes or your parser parses the document and it's not there, the parser is going to throw an error, like a fatal error to use the nomenclature from project one. But we'll demo that in just a moment. How about this? An attribute list for an element called list apparently takes one and apparently, it can only have three possible values. So one neat thing with DTD is that you can specify explicit values for, their, uh, for attributes. So this can be either the value bullets, ordered, or glossary. And the default declaration, so to speak, is going to be ordered, which is to say if you don't provide this thing, it's going to get a default value of ordered. So this, too, is kind of a powerful thing. You can use DTDs to ensure that if some attribute's not even there, it will be inserted there by the parser for you, the developer, who's receiving that series of SACS events or the DOM or the XML data itself. So that's a neat trick. Finally, or these last two, so a form element in this example can have a method attribute whose value is of type C data, but it must be fixed in this case to be post. So this clearly is sort of borrowed, at least partially, from the world of HTML. But it imposes perhaps an undue restriction in that it must be post. But that might make sense if you only want to support post, and therefore you want to ensure that that value is only as such. Finally, paper, and a paper element, can have an attribute called language of type C data. And if it's not there, it's going to take on a default value of English. Yeah? Can you go back to slide 31? Slide 31, sure. Good question. So these um, child elements, A, U, B, I, E, M, these are elements. They're not references or anything. So this is excerpted from the world of HTML, where this might represent the paragraph tag. This is the anchor tag, underline, bold, italics, and emphasis. So those are literally the tags. They're short tags, but they are HTML or XHTML tags. So all that line means is that a paragraph, just as you might expect intuitively, can not only have parsed character data, you know, just words and letters and numbers, but it can also have child elements nested in there, like an, a tag, uh, an, uh, a link, or bold facing, or italics, as in this example here. That's all. Other questions? All right, so attribute types. So here's where we really flesh out the different types of attribute values. So these are them. So what are they? C data, character data, including entities. So it's just you know, characters, the zero or more of them. ID, mentioned this earlier. Um, it must be unique. And here's the catch. And it's unfortunately kind of stupid. Must start with a letter. So contrary to what you would hope in an app, in a unique value, which in our world tends to be numeric, especially since we use them as numeric keys and databases, the ID type for an attribute, if present, must start with a letter, not with a number. Much like the names of tags, of elements, must start with a letter or an underscore, but not a number. So we've sort of seen this restriction before. In this one, particularly damning. So with that said, ID ref, this is kind of neat that it exists. Um, you don't necessarily use it that much, especially since the ID t uh, type is of limited value itself. But if you want to say that the value of this attribute is a reference to, that is a copy of another ID in the document, that can sometimes be a useful 
uh, feature. ID refs, these pluralities tend not to be used so much, but you can specify multiple values by spe separating them with one or more spaces. So if something's of type ID refs, that just means it's one or more IDs just space separated within the single quotes or double quotes. An entity just means that what's there has got to be an entity. Uh, entities, same thing, space separated. And name token, um, NM tokens and NM tokens, these are name tokens devoid as white space. So this is where you essentially want to have sort of an atomic value, not a sentence, but just a word. You might just say that it's a NM token. But that too is sort of of limited value and what you'll often see people use is just C data, even though it's slightly less restrictive. But the short, the short of it is that while it, DTD does offer a number of features and capabilities, it is absolutely limited. And so if you were sort of wondering to yourself, hmm, how would I do this? Again, quite, uh, could certainly be the case, you just can't. Yeah? Um, the ID, it needs to be unique within the whole document or just within elements of the same document? So like within the whole document, must the ID be unique? Correct. Literally as written, within document. Can't appear anywhere else as the value as an ID of another as an ID type for another attribute. So you could use it elsewhere as a value, but it can't be inside of an attribute's value that also is declared of type ID. Even in different Yes, correct. So again, restrictive. But less burden on the parser, frankly. Doesn't have to check as much. So um, just to summarize these, just so you have the formal definition fixed, uh, these kind of do what the names imply, even though this one's perhaps a little weird. I don't know why they didn't call it sharp optional, but sharp implied. Um, required means it's required. Fixed means it must be of the specified value. We saw an example of that. And again, this is, denotes optional. So where does it go? And this will tie back into our demonstrations here. So it can be either in the file itself, which just means you refer to it as an internal subset, just perhaps the more verbose way of describing it, or it can be in an external subset, which just means in a file unto itself, usually named something.dtd. Um, we saw an example of a song doc type earlier, excuse me, of a DTD. Um, you might have the equivalent in a file unto itself called song.dtd, and the syntax you would use to specify that this DTD is external to the file is still say doc type, still mention the root element, but you say, you know what, it's on the system file system in a file called song.dtd. Or in this last example, you can say, you know what, use the contents of song.dtd, but override the following definitions. So that's one trick you can use as well. Sort of use a base DTD and then tweak it, potentially, with one or more overrides. So be aware, I would say the most common, perhaps, are to use it, put it in the file itself, though that's somewhat inherently inefficient especially if you're going to be reusing the DTD, so perhaps this is the more common case. Or to associate it by some other mechanism altogether. For instance, Stylus and XML Spy and even Xerces allow you to, external to the document itself, manually choose what file to validate an XML document against. You don't need to trust that the XML document will tell you what to use. Uh, this would be a relative reference. So song.dtd in this case is assumed to be in the same directory as that XML file. Good question. Okay, so let's actually try to break something here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up at least two Java demos which are going to use these packages and or classes. We've actually seen error handler before, at least we've seen the simplified version in project one. Sax parser factor we've also seen, but simply I'm going to introduce an additional method call that you yourself might have glimpsed in the Java doc, but which quite simply allows us to turn on validation. So in our first Java file, which you should have a printout of tonight, you have something called, I think we'll do sax validator first dot Java. So this is quite simply, a demo that induces sax parsing, which in and of itself is so boring at this point, right? We've done this. You know how to do this. The only thing we're going to do differently is turn on the validating flag so that we're going to use the same sax demo, not to see what the output is, not to see what the sax events are, because we've done that, but just to see does validation work or not work. And quite simply, I'm going to call the factories set validating method passing it true. 
we're using, again, JAXP here. So that's from the standard API. You can look it up online in the JAXP reference, but you can also just trust that this is how you can do it. What this just means is that whatever SACS parser the factory spits out in the next line is going to be a validating parser. And that would be jargon to be familiar with. You would call something a validating parser or not. Um, what's it going to do? Uh, all it's going to do is capture warning. So I didn't even bother overriding start element, end element. Again, it's boring at this point. But notice that I did extend default handler so that we have empty implementations of them. And I did override the default implementations of error, warning, and fatal error, just so that we could see which of these is induced when you have a parsing error, so that you know what to expect and know, therefore, how to handle it yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and compile our Java code. And I'm going to run, and I'm going to open again just for a quick reminder. Song 1 is our song element demo, but with an internal subset. So that's all. And you should have a printout of that as well. If I didn't screw up prior to class, this should be valid. So I'm going to go Java of Sax Validator on song 1, enter. That's a good thing, right? The demo did nothing which is probably good because it means none of those error handling routines were invoked and the whole thing got parsed, all those SACS events got fired and that was it. So what if we break this? Let's open song one again. Suggest to me a way to break the validity of this document. Add another length. Add another length. All right, so I'm going to go down here and I say, you know what, this is actually 14 minutes long. All right, save it. And just to be clear, which definition is it going to violate? Now you have two. Yeah. So length question mark only means 0 or 1, not 0 or 2. So this should be an error of validity. So I'm going to go ahead and run the program again. And this time we do get a parsing error. The content of element type song must match quote unquote such and such. So Xerxes is helpful. It doesn't quite tell you what the error is, but at least gives you in sort of JDK spirit sort of a hint as to where to go look. That though, for you, the developer, might be completely uninteresting because frankly, who cares where the error is? The point is that the document is invalid. You're not going to want to touch it. So you can now abort or report an error or simply respond to this error in any manner you see fit. Or you can ignore it if you kind of want to take a leap of faith and assume I'll deal with this and just hope that my code still works. It's really up to you. And that's why also sort of in answer to a question that was asked on the listserv a while ago, why do we not just call system.exit on parsing errors? Well, that would be rather contrary to the developer's potential wants to keep proceeding, or at least to handle this error himself. If I go back into the file, let's fix this. Um, this, incidentally, would not be an error of validity, just to be a little precise here. So this document, true, it's not valid, but it's also not what? Right, so this is one of the other big pieces of jargon we used early on. A document to be well formed has to have all of the basics together, right? Quotes are closed. Uh, things that are uppercase in one place must be uppercase in another place. You have to open tags and also close them in reverse order and so forth. So if it violates sort of the basic idea of XML, you don't even get to the point of validity. This is where your own, my first parser in project one, should have bailed with some kind of parsing error but not related to validity. So a document, to be clear, can only be valid or really invalid if it's already well formed. Otherwise, it's sort of unclear if it even could be valid or invalid. So just to show you the error thrown here, I'll run the program again. And now we get a fatal parser warning. So it's worded slightly differently, since this is an error of well formedness. And at least this time, Xerxes is a bit more helpful, saying that it's got to be terminated with a closing tag at least more helpful in that regard. Finally, is there anything else we could do that requires very few keystrokes on my part to break the validity of this document? Just to show you how simple mistakes, frankly, can trigger errors of validity. Throw, so throw a semicolon in. All right, so let's just put that there. Does, should that be acceptable? No, because a song is not allowed to have mixed character data, PC data. So let's run this. Parsing error, so there too. Not very instructive, but we know there's something wrong. Finally, I could maybe move things around, put year before length. That's probably a no-no as well. Yep, parsing error as well. So again, to be clear, it's up to you, the developer, how to handle this, but the parser does invoke one of these, in JAXP at least, these error handling mechanisms so that you can write code against the error. How about an external subset? Well, in song two, 
.xml. Same file, different doc type declaration. All it does is give, it the, give the parser a hint as to where to look for song.dtd. It's going to be on the local file system, presumably in the current working directory. I'm going to go ahead and run our SACS validator on song2, and it too appears to be valid. Why is that? Well, if I open song.dtd, same file, I could break it again and say, you know what, forget about title. I'm going to leave the title declaration there. It's doing no harm because it's just not used anywhere. Now let's run the code again. Parsing error. So many, many ways to break this. The point, though, is that the tools you've been using already support this functionality, and with one line of change, can you actually add this very powerful trick of ensuring that your data is going to be as you expect? And that would be the Jack's P approach. So finally, there's such an interest in white space, it seems, over time. Why not finally answer that question when and when not is white space relevant or significant? Turns out the answer does lie in DTDs or XML schemas. So consider this example here. Foo, bar, baz. Intuitively, the white space in this document probably isn't relevant, just knowing what it means to be foobar and baz, and there is white space. There's a new line there, there's a tab or some spaces, spaces, another new line, new line, maybe new lines after that. So the question on the table is do we finally have the tools with which to say this white space is or is not significant? The upside for you being if you can specify as much, you can finally trust that you're not going to get superfluous calls to your character sax event. You're not going to get superfluous nodes in your DOM containing just white space. You can just assume that they'll be removed from the parser. Well, the only way you can have your parser remove ignorable white space, as we've called it, is to tell it by way of a DTD or a schema to ignore it. And it turns out now that it's very simple to do so. In white space demo .java, we again have an extension of default handler. Notice again, I'm turning on validation with that one line of code. And notice that what it now does is it does borrow all that code from, I think, lecture two for start element, end element, that just prints out that pseudocode for our SACS events. The utility today will be that it shows us is there white space in the SACS events fired. And the goal then is going to be to ensure that there is no white space in those uh, SACS events. So how do we do that? Well, take a look at, let's say, uh, ignorable white space .xml. Here's that same snippet, foobar and baz, but explain to me now, based on inference alone, why this document contains ignorable white space by definition now. That is to say, why does this file alone imply that any new lines or tab characters that previously have been problematic are now by definition ignorable. And what does not follow either of those in the definition? Perfect. So the fact that in our DTD internal subset here, we have not specified a mixed content model. That is, there's no mention in foo as a child PC data. That means that foo cannot have parsed character data as its children. Now, wait a minute. Technically, slash backslash n and backslash t and space, those are characters. They are parsed character data, or candidates for parsed character data, but they're handled specially. So because white space has this sort of unique distinction in humans' eyes as being useful, but fundamentally useless from a programmatic sense, if you have PC data that happens to be white space characters, but you have not specified that PC data is among the children for an element, then it will be ignored by the parser. That is to say, because foo is defined as having only two children, bar and baz, and in that order, what that tells the parser implicitly is to just ignore any white space and to assume that it's just there for humans' eyes, not for its own. Correct. The whites, any white space nested inside of bar or baz would be significant because those by definition are allowed to have parsed character data. So what does this mean? If I run now the white space demo on ignorable white space, notice the SACS events that are fired according to our pseudocode. It's sort of very clean output, very pretty. No superfluous characters. But now take a look at the file called significant white space. 
which is almost the same down here, but what's different up top? Foo is defined as having any content model, which is you know, even more loose than to say mixed content model with PC data, comma, bar, comma, baz, star. So in this case, Foo can have any type of children, which certainly includes white space characters. And so if I run our white space demo now on significant white space .xml, notice that you get that ugly effect we saw in lecture two because it's not being ignored, it's being considered significant. This is to say, if you, the programmer, then want to just get rid of all that nice user-friendly white space and ensure that it doesn't even reach your application, so long as you validate the input against a DTD, you can effectively have Xerxes, or whatever parser you're using, throw it away for you before it even reaches you. And that can certainly be useful, because it means you're not constantly calling trim or some regular expression to replace those characters. It can certainly save you time at a cost, because it means not only is white space being stripped at validation time, all the other validity checking is happening as well. So again, as with most things, it's a trade-off. Yeah? The reference to the DTD is a schema always within the XML document, or can it be called directly from the Java code? Good question. Is the reference to the DTD or schema to be used always in the XML document, or can it be uh, specified external to the document? The latter. You can always specify it externally if your tool allows you to do so. And you can do that, for instance, with um, certainly XML Spy or with uh, Stylus. You should be able to do that as well with Xerces itself, specifying what to validate it against. If you turn on set validating as we've done, what that does is it looks for the predefined association that would be, say, in the XML file itself. No, within JAXP, I believe there is a method call or calls you can use to specify another DTD or schema altogether. But I would have to look at the Java docs myself. Other questions on validation? Let's see. Also in here, let me just see if there's a couple of others. White space demo, song DTD. Uh, what's also in here were just a couple of other examples which I'll just offer as at-home exercises if you want to play around. So there's a simple example of an email in XML format with an associated DTD. There's that XHTML example we did look at. And then, of course, there are the song examples as well. But for the most part, we've plucked off, I think, the, the meatiest of the examples. White space is the only thing that's ignored, even if it is technically character data. And I think the spec uh, enumerates the five or so characters that are considered white space, with backslash n, backslash t, backslash f, and then white, the space itself, and then I think one other. Backslash r, probably. All right, so um, just to put them out there, the less used entities we've seen, and I think we mentioned early on, especially NBSP, if you want to use that in an environment that doesn't just give it to you for free, like Stylus, for instance, has sometimes done. Uh, here's another example of how you might use an entity, and I think Michael Kay refers to this kind of use in his book, if you've skimmed through that. If you essentially want to have like a macro, effectively, and have a bunch of text pasted throughout, you can reference it by way of an entity, just to save you time. Um, notations, this is one thing that um, underused, but you can reference binary data, for instance, by way of something like a notation, which this sort of hints at, referencing a GIF, for instance, on the local system in that manner, but I would say that is rarely used, so we certainly don't dwell on it, but you can certainly look up the syntax online or experiment with it if you do find yourself with a need. So what remains to be done if we now have this tool within our toolkit, so to speak? So among the things to bear in mind about DTD is one, it's not XML itself, which frankly at this point might be a relief to finally see something that's not uh, where minimal, terseness is of minimal importance. But the fact of the matter is from a parser's perspective, it's certainly annoying for the guy who had to write the parser to not only have to write an XML parser, which works for everything except the language in which the metadata is itself specified. You have to write effectively a separate parser for DTD. And that, if nothing else, was perhaps Foolish, though I'm, certain, I'm sure there were motivations to keep the two distinct. No built-in data types. Maybe good, maybe bad, but you can certainly come up with scenarios where as a developer it would be nice if someone else did your data typing or data type checking for you. There's no support for custom data types. You're pretty much limited to the list you saw tonight, and that itself is rather limited given some of the shortcomings we saw. 
no support for ranges. So this too is going to be a neat feature of schema where not only can you specify this has got to be a number, you can even at validation time ensure that it's going to be a four digit number or a number in the range of 2000 to 2007 for instance. You can push all of that logic off to the validator so that you, the developer, only get to deal with the more interesting stuff. And frankly, data typing and checking ranges and stripping white space, these are not particularly fun problems to play with, especially if someone else can deal with that for you. Namespace aware, and this is becoming an increasing gotcha. The more and more namespaces are used as all these languages are intermingled, DTD just doesn't know about them, so it does, doesn't support them. Finally, the content models must be deterministic. For those of you with more of a theoretical bent who sort of like exploring the ideas of what kind of uh, finite automaton could go about parsing these documents and checking for validity and so forth, unfortunately, the content models allowed by DTD are entirely deterministic. Now, what does that mean? Well, think of this fairly reasonable example. Suppose that you wanted to have an element called foo have three children, Bar, Baz, and Quux, but you don't care about the order. Because think of this as maybe street, city, and state. You, know, you want those three components, but frankly, who the heck cares what order they come in with the document? Can't do it with DTD. That sort of simple example, and what this captures is that idea using foo, bar, baz, and quux. This model, which it sounds like you can write, Right? Already, this sort of should throw up a red flag. My god, to implement some simple idea like that, ensure that it has a bar, baz, and quux, but I don't care about the order, you're already talking about sort of uh, you know, what six different content models you need to allow for. Moreover, you can't write that. The parser should yell at you saying this is not a valid content model for the reason that it's not deterministic. Well, what does that mean? If you were implementing a finite automaton to process this content model, Notice that both this option and this option, for instance, start with the same child element. So this is not a deterministic content model because at that point in time, either this one might apply to your document or this one, and that's not allowed. It must be possible for the parser literally to walk through your document and the DTD and to know exactly where it should be going. In this case, it's sort of like a fork in the road, and DTDs are not expected to have to deal with this. So this is just to say, and it's not necessarily a damning shortcoming, but it's certainly one of the shortcomings for a very, dare say, reasonable requirement in a document. Fortunately, schema will solve this and other shortcomings, but again, we'll return to this world where verboseness is of, or terseness is of minimal importance. And in the case of the bar, bad, or quirks, zero or one is supported by zero or one. No. So could you simply specify uh, bar baz quux in parentheses star question mark? That wouldn't solve the problem because that would then allow you to have um, multiple bars, bazes, and quuxes based on the definition of star because the star would imply, apply before the question mark. Other questions? All right. Let's officially adjourn here. We'll see you in two weeks.